And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, once again, we're going to just pick up where we left off after our last program. And uh, <clears throat> I realize we've taught two half hours now on giving, and uh, we're not going to run a good thing into the ground, so we're going to move on into some new territory. But uh, we'll go on into 2 Corinthians chapter 10 for this next half hour. Again, we always like to let our television audience understand that we're just an informal Bible study, and I stress the word informal. <laughs> And you have no idea how many people write and say, don't ever put on a suit and tie. And I write back and say, don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> because when we first were invited to do this by this particular station in Tulsa, and I came up and Iris with me, and we sat down at a breakfast meeting here in town, that was one of the things I stipulated. I will not come up here in a suit and tie. Well, that's all right. You don't have to. Well, we've proved a point, and our audience is in full agreement that my kind of teaching does not demand a suit and tie. And so we're informal, we're not backed by anybody, and somebody just reminded me today, they came back from one of our listening areas, and a lot of the people do not understand that we are not underwritten, we don't have a big church congregation to help us pay the bills, and we pay our television bills strictly with money that comes from our listening audience. I, I don't like to ask for money, I won't, but I guess we do have to let people know that we pay for television time, and Lord knows I can't afford it, so it has to come from our viewing audience. And we do. We, we just thank you so much. My, so many of these folks are so faithful. Month after month after month, we can just about bet the farm that their checks are going to be in the mail, and we appreciate that so much. Now we have everything available on the videotape, and now we have started producing them on the same six-hour format is available on the audio tape. And, of course, they're also available on the little books as you see them on the screen. So if you're interested, you call us or write to us. And uh, we like to send the list out that shows the table of contents of all these things. And then uh, you can order from that. Now, again, we're going to go right back in. This is a Bible study, and uh, this is where we like to use most of our time. And let's go ahead now to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, I know that some of these things are repetitious. And uh, it's not just me that's repetitious, the Scripture is. How many times the Bible will repeat and repeat and repeat? And of course, the Holy Spirit is the master teacher, and He knows better than any secular teacher that that is the very basis of good teaching, is repetition. And uh, one of these first programs, I'm going to have to go back and put my timeline on the board again, because you have no idea. How many people have written or called to say it was the timeline that got them interested in this program and in Bible study? And it's been a long time since we've put it on the board, so uh, maybe if we need a little uh, filling up of time and finishing 2 Corinthians, we will go back to that in a later program. But whatever. We, uh, we just trust that people will begin to enjoy their Bible, to study it, to read it, not just to be able to say, well, I read my Bible today, but to really feed on it and to understand what it's talking about. All right, now I said repetition. How many times haven't I used the statement, Paul has to defend his apostleship? And here we have it again in chapter 10. Because, you see, the poor man was under constant attack, especially from the Judaizing Jews, that he was an imposter, he had drummed all this up himself, that after all he had no badge of authority, he had no letters of commendation, he couldn't claim to have walked with Jesus three years like Peter, James, and John. And so this was the thing he had to constantly overcome. Well, who are you? Who do you think you are? That reminds me of a lady who called from Minnesota several years ago, and that's just exactly what she said. I said, Feldix, and she said, is this Les Feldix? And I said, yes. She said, who in the world are you? <laughs> well, I said, I'm a nobody, and that's all that I have ever claimed to be. I'm a nobody. Well, Paul didn't have to say that. Paul says, I'm somebody. I have been commissioned as an apostle to the Gentiles. And so here again, Verse 1 of chapter 10, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you, I beg you, 
by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, speaking now of himself, but being absent, I'm bold toward you. Now, as they'll say a little later in this, in this chapter, you know, his, way, his letters are weighty, but his presence is weak. All right, so he said, being absent, I'm bold toward you, that is in his writing, but, verse 2, I beseech you, that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Now, do you see what he's saying? There were people out there, probably amongst his congregations, who did not recognize his divine appointment as an apostle of Christ because he couldn't claim to have walked with Jesus in his earthly ministry, see? All right, let's go back a minute. I think this is an appropriate time to review for just a second. Go back to Acts chapter 9, where we have the first of three accounts in the book of Acts of his conversion on the road to Damascus, which, of course, I think most people have heard from their pulpits and Sunday school material. But I'm afraid that too many totally overlook one of the crucial statements of the Lord Jesus himself here in Acts chapter 9 and beginning at verse 11. Acts chapter 9, and let's drop in at verse 11. After Saul has had that tremendous experience outside the city, <clears throat> and now the Lord says unto a Jew inside Damascus, Ananias by name, and the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight. Inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he, Saul, is doing what? He's praying. And he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. In other words, the Lord's preparing everything. Verse 13, then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man and how much evil he hath done to the saints at Jerusalem, that is, in his persecution. And here in Damascus he has authority from the chief priests to bind or to bring back in prison all that call on thy name. Now you want to remember this was the sole purpose of Saul of Tarsus working in the name of Judaism was to totally remove from the nation of Israel anybody who had recognized Christ Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. And Ananias knew that. And so he's, he's you might say, arguing with the Lord. And he said, but Lord, everybody knows what kind of a man Saul is. Verse 15, but the Lord said unto him, now watch in red if you have a red letter edition, from the Lord Jesus himself, he says to Ananias, go thy way, for he, Saul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the, what's the next word? Gentiles. And my, you want to remember that up until this time, that was almost a dirty word in the language of a Jew. And there this man is going to go first and foremost to the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Of course, Paul never lost his desire to see Jews saved. But now look at the next verse, 16. Jesus says long before his ministry even began, I will show him, that is Saul, how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. What goes around comes around. Now, you want to remember, he had caused utmost suffering. In fact, stay in Book of Acts and go to chapter 22. No, 26. There are three accounts. It's in Acts chapter 9, 22, and again in 26. But I want the one in 26, where he readily admitted the havoc that he had wreaked amongst the Jewish followers of Jesus of Nazareth. Acts 26, verse 9. Acts 26, dropping down to verse 9. And Paul, of course, is speaking in the first person. He's addressing this crowded uh, courtroom before Agrippa. And now he says, I verily thought with myself 
that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. See that? In his earthly ministry. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem. Now look at it. And many of the saints, that is, the believing Jews who had embraced Jesus of Nazareth, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death. You see that? It wasn't just a, a nominal persecution. He persecuted them to the death. And so he says, and when they were put to death and it was made a, a vote, he said, I gave my vote or voice against them. In other words, as these people came up before the Sanhedrin and made their confession of accepting Christ as the Messiah, the Sanhedrin would vote for it. And Paul says, I voted to put them to death. He had no mercy. And his persecution, I think, was cruel. All right, verse 11. I punish them oft. Now oh, you just got to stop and think. What kind of punishment did the Jews like to use? Well, the lash, 39 stripes. And Paul was all in favor of it. Whip them. Make them deny their confession. And so he says, I punish them oft in every synagogue and cause them to what? Blaspheme. Now listen, he didn't do that with words. He did that with the actions of the authority and the whipmasters and what have you until these poor Jewish believers were either beaten to death or would finally succumb. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even to strange cities. He didn't confine it to Jerusalem. Wherever Paul or Saul of Tarsus heard there was an element of believing Jews that Jesus was the Christ, he went after him. And of course, this is his whole purpose of going to Damascus. He thought he had pretty well cleansed the little nation of Israel. Now he had to leave the country and go to Damascus and get those Jews up there. Okay, now all of that is the groundwork. First, God commissions him to go to the Gentiles. God tells Ananias, this man is going to suffer great things for my name's sake. And on the other hand, Paul tells us how much suffering he had caused. And I have to feel that every time that Paul came under one sort of oppression or another, that was his first memory. But look what I did in opposition to this myself. And how God had the perfect candidate to take all of the abuse because he had handed out so much himself and it just carried him, I think, until the day as I read someplace the other night, that of course we all believe that Paul was beheaded by the Roman government, but I read the other day that the last few yards to the chopping block, he literally ran. He was ready to give it all up. He was ready to offer himself. And uh, I think it's probably true. All right, back to chapter 10 then of 2 Corinthians. So here he is defending again his apostleship. Verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, he was not an angel, he was a man. And he walked and he ate and he talked, he fought the same temptations that you and I do. You know, I, I've made the point over and over how many times, I think I can probably show you the one, the quickest in, in Philippians, that's just over a few pages to the right. And uh, go to Philippians, and I think it's in chapter 3. Yeah, Philippians chapter 3, and, and just look at verse 17. Now, this isn't the only time he says this by inspiration. Now, I know I'll have people jump on me once in a while. Fortunately, not too severely, but they'll say, well, now, Les, I go by what Jesus said. I'm following Jesus. And I say, well, that's not what my Bible tells me. Look what my Bible tells me, and I trust yours tells you in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Brethren, he's writing to Gentile believers up there in Philippi. Brethren, be followers together of who? Me. We're to follow the apostle, see? 
and mark them who walk so as you have us, Paul, as a what? An example. Now, that's not taking anything away from the Lord Jesus, not at all. But you want to remember that when Jesus walked the footsteps of Galilee and across the Galilee Sea, he was God. I can't walk in the steps of God. And I put it graphically to one individual one time when he started walking across the Sea of Galilee, I couldn't follow. I had to be like Peter, I'd go down, see? So we have to be careful how we take some of these things. But this man, he was just as human as I am. He got just as hungry. I think he got just as angry be times. And he had just as many failures and temptations as I have and as you have. Now that's the kind of a person I can follow because I know that that is humanly possible. All right, and so again, Philippians chapter 3, be followers together of me and mark them who walk so as you have us for an example. And my, if more believers could only walk in the footsteps of this man, as he, as he put it, followed Christ. Of course he did. That was his whole life. For he says, for me to die is gain, see? But he lived in order to follow and to please his Savior. All right, verse... Three again, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. In other words, all the things that he is writing to the Corinthians and to us about were not the material and the physical, but the spiritual. And so, yes, he says, I'm walking in the flesh. I am an ordinary human being. But where was the warfare? In the spiritual realm. And we're going to see it more and more. My, Satan is pulling all the plugs today, isn't he? And when the Lord Jesus warned the disciples that one of the first signs of the end time would be mass deception, he said, be not deceived. Beloved, we're seeing it on every hand, and we have only one alternative. Don't run to me. Don't run to some denomination. You run to the book. What is the book saying about it? You know, over and over, people will call and tell me what they're up against. And I say, well, all right. What does the Bible say about this particular thing? Well, I can't find it. I was all right. If you can't find that the Bible teaches it, you run from it. Because if it's not scriptural, then God has no intentions for you to follow that kind of teaching. All right, but Paul says that his war was not after the flesh. It was in the realm of the spiritual. For the weapons, verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not of the flesh, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And did he? Oh, you bet he did. As he moved into those pagan cities. Why do you remember the city of Ephesus, which was so completely taken over by the worship of Diana? And he made such an impact on that city that it was literally destroying the work of the idol makers, those silversmiths, until they caused a riot. Now, one man did that to a, to a complete city, see? All right, so that was an example of pulling down strongholds. Verse 5, casting down imaginations and everything that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Now just stop and think a minute. Are we seeing it? On every hand. On every hand. Oh, we're seeing all this stuff that looks so great. But does it line up with the book? Is it the power of God? That's what we have to ask ourselves, see? And bringing, verse 5 again, reading on, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now that's quite a that's quite a statement, isn't it? No, I think I'm just like everybody else. Where do we have our largest problem? Well, in the thought processes. That's where we have to fight most of our battles, the temptations in the thought. And I mentioned in the last program, before we do anything, before we say anything, what do we have to do? We have to think it. And so we have to consider that this is where we have to fight our, our major battles. All right, verse 6. 
and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. No, that's just plain language. The more obedient we are to the Word of God, the more disobedient we're going to be to the things of the world. And when you get disobedient to the things of the world, you're going to start hearing about it. You're going to start feeling it. All right, verse 7. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. And then he's going to go on to say that we have to be able to examine our own faith to be sure that you're certain of your eternal destiny. Never take it carelessly. All right, reading on. Verse 8, For though I should boast somewhat of our, what's the next word? Authority. What's he talking about? His apostolic authority. See? And he says, though I boast somewhat of our authority. Now he's using the plural pronoun, but he's speaking of himself. Which the Lord hath given us. See? He didn't get it by working for it. He didn't get it by coming up through the ranks like we normally think of things in, in our present world. I mean, when a corporate president reaches that pinnacle of success, usually he's paid his dues. He's come from the lower echelons and he's worked his way up. But see, the Apostle Paul didn't do that. He came from an abject persecutor to the apostle of the risen Christ to the Gentiles. All right. So he says, so if I should boast of our authority, verse 8 again, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction. Oh, now what's that a flashback to? His days as a persecutor. How many lives didn't he persecute as a religious Jew? But this isn't his role as an apostle now. It is to edify the saints. And not for your destruction, he says, and I should not be ashamed. Now he comes on to verse 9, and I alluded to this in our last program, that he said that I may not seem as if I would terrify you with what? Letters. Well, they were making reference to his first letter where he really read them the riot act. And we pointed that out as we taught 1 Corinthians, how he was correcting their abuses. And he called a spade a spade, and he made no bones about it. So he says, I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. Now, he's quoting some of the rumors that had come back to him. And don't think for a minute the apostle didn't hear just about everything that was ever said. It always get back to him. For, he says, his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence, that is in the flesh, is weak, and his speech, what? Contemptible. Now you have to stop and think about some of these things. There was something about the apostle that did not just automatically draw people to him like some charismatic men can do. But he had something about him that was almost the opposite. And I think I know what it was, and if I don't get into it in this program, we'll cover it when we get to Galatians. But he had a physical appearance that did not turn people on, as we say today. It, it just kind of held them at bay. And his speech, contemptible. Now that's hard for me to believe, except as I look at it in one light. Paul said back in 2 Corinthians, no, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, that he spoke in languages more than all of them. Now, I think his basic language was Hebrew and Greek. Now, there were no doubt throughout the Roman Empire people from other language backgrounds to whom he ministered. Now, I gave you the example several weeks ago, one of the guides we had in Israel who, when he was guiding us, had perfect English, although you could tell it wasn't his mother tongue. But he told us before the tour was over that he could speak seven languages. But I'm willing to bet that some of those seven languages were not always grammatically pure. They did not always just ring 100% true, even as he did with us. I could catch him in English once in a while where he did not have perfect grammar. And so for people that get picky, you see, that's all they need. 
And so I think what they're saying is that when it came to some of these other languages other than his native tongue, that he may not have had the perfect grammar and they would just grasp at anything to, to, uh, to criticize. And so the man is so human. Now verse 11, let such a one who says things like this, let such a one think this, that such as we are in word by letters, when we are absent, such will be also indeed when we are present. Now, of course, as he quote, uh, dictated these letters, and I think everyone's agreed that except for Galatians, he always used a secretary of sorts. And so maybe this secretary was able to, to help him with some of the grammar or whatever, but his letters they couldn't find fault with. They were perfect, and of course, they were Holy Spirit inspired. We don't want everyone to take that away. All right, now verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Ooh. Now, in so many words, you know what he's saying? Folks, I know you have people coming into the congregation who are finding fault with me. And they're trying to elevate their own position. But in their lack of knowledge, they really don't know what they are doing. Now, when we get to Galatians, I'll be pointing this out, especially in chapter 2. Because when Paul makes reference in Galatians 2 to the 12 down in Jerusalem, he speaks to them as men who seemed to be pillars. And that's exactly what this verse is saying. There are men that were ridiculing and criticizing his ministry who no longer had the power and the clout that they thought they had. And they hadn't realized that it was slipping away. But, Paul says, I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Thank you for watching.